Hi, welcome to Cinephiles, a special episode we're doing, uh, Brunch with the Cinephiles, which requires a special guest. We're having bagels, we're noshing. This is, this is brunch. It's a New York brunch. term. This is brunch. So we're having fruit salad, we're having bagels, we're, we're, we're good to go, we got our coffee. But more importantly, we have a very special guest here with us today. It's Mr. Mike White hey, of the Projection here. Booth Podcast. You guys must, must have heard of this guy. Has a very popular website. We're very happy to have him with us today. He's Thanks. he's in town for the Cinekink Festival. Uh, I am a judge at the festival or jury member. I'm not sure judge or jury. Definitely not executioner. And have been out here since Tuesday, watching a lot of movies, uh, going to every screening. And I think they've had about five or six features, and then a ton of shorts. And I'm judging the shorts and. Just turned in my ballot this morning. Uh, what kind of films are you seeing at Cineking? I'm seeing a lot of, like I said, a lot of shorts, a lot of, um, there's actually a lot of comedy going on. Uh, there's some hardcore stuff. It is rather kinky. Uh, there it's are, the Cineking type. Yes, exactly. Um, there's been a lot of short documentaries this year, which is kind of nice. And yeah, it's really a, a really mixed bag. So since this won't probably air until after Right. The judgings are in. All that stuff. <laughs> uh, what are your picks for the best films you've seen this year? Well, for me, my favorite stuff, I really like. There was one called Ritual, uh, which was absolutely terrific. It was about this guy in San Francisco, I think it is. And he, every, I want to say it's every few months, he will um, get hooked on his back and be lifted up, uh, s suspended about three, four feet off the ground. He's HIV positive and he uses this kind of as his cleansing ritual and he huh. has uh, a whole bunch of his friends come in and it's kind of this energy exchange. And it was a great documentary. It's only about five minutes long. And you start off, or at least I started off, and I was just completely squeamish watching, you know, these huge hooks get put through this guy's back. And that whole, like, man right. called horse lifting up of, of this guy. Isn't that your, your <coughs> exercise regimen every morning? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's the, no Clive, that's the Clive Barker workout. I, I'm not into that. But it was great because then by the end, you feel for this guy and you see the love that is in the room and just to hear him talk about it afterwards, that this is kind of what helps him get through being HIV positive. Interesting. It was just, uh, by the end, I was tearing up. How does that, I mean, do, is this, because I'm totally ignorant, mm -hmm. to, to do, do they have, is there a, um, like a, a standard or, okay, you have straight out porn, mm -hmm. you know, that you would get on DVD right. or get pay-per-view. Do they have, do they draw the line behind what they consider just to be complete, just utter porn? Or does there have to be some sort of standard bearer? To, there has to be something behind it that it's, elevates it above. There's definitely something there to it. I mean, like the the bring it uh, scenario. The, sorry, the bring it uh, selections. They're probably the closest you're going to get to straight up porn. They're the kind of things that you could go to. Right. Maybe not your neighborhood video store, if such a thing still existed, and be able to go in the back room and get. Right. They're more like special order kind of stuff but uh, they're probably the closest you're gonna get to, not necessarily, there's not a whole lot of social message going on in there, but there is a message in that you're seeing differently typed people, a lot of people that are kind of disenfranchised. So seeing like two um, you know, uh, very butch lesbians go at it in a kitchen, um, you know, that, you're not going to see when you turn on Cinemax. You, you know? mean Skinemax. Right. That's that. So let me ask you, all your film, all the films that you'll be watching probably violate th the three P's. Which are? No penis, no pink, no penetration. <laughs> I learned that when I used to work at a video company. We Very had, nice. we, all our videos could not violate the three P's. This is their 10th year, so they're celebrating their decade of decadence, as they say. And then the organizer will take it and take smaller selections of films and then tour it around. So she hits... Los Angeles, Chicago, I think Seattle, maybe Austin, but yeah, throughout the year you can see Cine Kink in different parts of the country. Is there, is there anything about the uh, Cine, Cine Kink you want to elaborate on that you think people out there might have a misconception on? Well, it's not all just hardcore films. There are some hardcore scenes in some of the stuff, but really um, there's a lot of just human stories out there. I mean, there things range from you know, total full out comedy with a little bit of a kinky edge, you know, like a guy who thinks that he's going to die so he wants to have sex and then be shot at the same time, you know. 
there's no penetration going on in there. There's no boobage, nothing like that. But, you know, it doesn't violate the three Ps. Oh, shame. Yeah, but <laughs> it's not going to be running, you know, on HBO or anything like right. that. And who are you, Mike White? Yeah, what do you do? <laughs> Tell us about your podcast. Yeah, who the fuck are you? Why do we want you on our well, show? Well, I'm not the guy that was on The Amazing Race. And I'm not exactly. on be here. School yeah. of Rock. I'm not on Enlightened right now with Laura Dern. So, yeah, uh, co-host of a podcast called The Projection Booth. I've been doing that since March of 2011, I guess, coming up on our two-year anniversary, and before that, um, well, I still am kind of doing this, the uh, Behind the Zine, Cashiers to Cinemart, was doing that since 94, uh, working on a couple book projects, um, you know, I alluded a little bit before, I'm the dude that made uh, Who Do You Think You're Fooling about Tarantino, um, and uh, kind of taking City on Fire without which, much credit. Which is infamous now. Yes. It's been all over. This is the guy. He's using my word. You can't use infamous. That's my word. <laughs> but it's an appropriate usage in this well, that, point. That, that means you use it. infamous no, 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 for no, everything. No, 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 I do. <laughs> You'd be like, way, President no, Obama, no, our no, infamous no, president. No, 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 yes. no, no. I would do. So, Mike, now it's infamous. <laughs> but I loan it to you today. You're that guy. You're the guy who introduced everyone to that. Yeah. yeah. You have to tell... I know you said the story... Uh, on your recent podcast mm -hmm. on Reservoir Dogs. Right. But please repeat that. Well, uh, yeah, years and years ago, I was a big fan of Reservoir Dogs and would watch that all the damn time. And it really kind of uh, lit a fire under my ass. I was going to film school at University of Michigan and found out from a friend of mine, Mike Thompson, that... Uh, it wasn't as original as I thought it was. You know, I was, you know, totally into Reservoir Dogs. I went out and I rented The Killing and um, the, uh, Asphalt Jungle and just pretty much anything that Tarantino would talk about in interviews, I would go out and find these movies, you know, any, like, even offhanded remark. It's like, oh, you know, Redline 5000. You right. know, I'm one of the few people that suffered through that film. So, you know, going out, finding all this stuff, and then my friend comes in, he's like, oh, hey, did you see this thing in Empire Magazine? Reservoir Dogs looks like it was taken from this Chinese movie. So it's like, okay, now I have to find that out. Went to a Chinese uh, grocery store, went through all the videos and everything, nothing's in English, you know, and I finally found the tape, watched it, and I was just like, yeah, yeah, there's some similarities here. So uh, I would show that to my housemates, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I can see some similarities. I'm like, no, no, no. This part is the same as this, and this is the same as that. And then rather than trying to explain it, I just went into the, uh, the, the video editing lab at, at, at school, took that and, you know, did a really shitty VHS <laughs> transfer and made this Those first version. Yeah, That's what we had. Uh, yeah, sent that. I, got a, I uh, saw it in Film Threat uh, that they were talking about the similarities. And being the typical film geek, I was like, oh, you guys, psh, I was so far ahead of you. Take a look at this tape. Uh, was know. this when Film Threat was still based out of Michigan? No, they were just Or was this when Chris in, Gore uh, got rid of it? They were in L.A. and Gore was still part of it. Okay. And they were doing the film, film Threat and Film Threat Video Guide. And next thing I know, Gore's calling me up going, oh, my God, this is great. You know, you got to... You know, send me the, uh, you know, a better copy of this. This is awesome. We're going to tear Hollywood a new asshole, yada, yada, yada. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, wow, you know, this is pretty cool. So, yeah, I redid the whole thing, sent it out to him. And that was the last I heard from him for a long darn time. Oh, <laughs> but then next thing I know, I start hearing about how it's playing at different festivals and stuff. And I said, oh, well, apparently this is getting some traction out there, which is weird to hear that your movie is playing at a festival that you didn't really even enter. Right. Uh, but I entered the New York Underground Film Festival, and that was right when Pulp Fiction was up for an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. So it was kind of like right at the perfect time where Miramax was doing a lot of damage control. New York Underground was, I think, in its second year and really trying to be this upstart film, um, you know, film festival. So, uh, yeah, I got a lot of notoriety back then about that and then just... I. You know, spent the last and few you can, minutes you can of my still see this. Minutes. I mean, you can yeah. just go online and like check it oh, out. Oh, yeah. What's the full name of it? Who so do you some... think you're fooling? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about the podcast. So, you started at about you said 2011? Yeah. About oh, two I didn't realize ago. it's that recent. So, what is so what tells the genesis of, of your podcast? Well, uh, like a lot of things that I do, I'll be totally honest. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I said, I like some things about these, but there are other things that I don't like. 
and I got the idea, a friend of mine and I were talking, we said we should do a podcast, and I pretty much wrote down all the things that we shouldn't do, and then that kind of determined what we should do, and we said, okay, you know, we're not going to do the, you know, what did you watch this week, and all that kind of stuff, and just cut all the chit-chat, go into the movie, talk about the movie, discuss something, try to get interviews if we can, and just really kind of dedicate an hour to one of our favorite films. And we would go through, and each week we would kind of uh, pair off, you know, one week was my choice, one week was his choice, and we did that for a while. Then I got a new host about, gosh, 60 episodes ago, new co-host, Rob St. Mary, and that's been doing great. And then he's got really different film tastes than mine, so he's showing me stuff that I've never seen. I'm showing him stuff that he's never seen, and we're just kind of uh, going from there. One of the really good things about your podcast is that you're able to get people that are involved with the making of the movie. Right. Uh, one of my favorite episodes that you've done. It's probably, I mean, it's, it's the, be the best one I've, I've listened to so far is The Blade Runner. Oh, Which is thanks. extensive and complete, but you've got, uh, you know, people involved in making a film on that. You had, mm -hmm. what's his name, who wrote uh, the definitive book on the making of yeah, Blade Paul Runner. Yeah, Paul M. Salmon. Yes. Yep. Uh, and it's just, it's just so extensive and so complete. How did you, how do you... What do you do? Do you just like contact these people, yeah. approach them, and they say, yeah. I'll, 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 sure, I'll do your podcast. And how do, you, how do you find them, and then how do you convince them to be on your show? Well, a lot of it is just, um, you know, we kind of started to build a reputation early off, and just uh, when I would send emails to people, I would say, you know, would you like to be on the show? Here are some of our past guests, and kind of say, you know, here, that we have a, like a pedigree kind of thing. And really, I have to say uh, that that Blade Runner show, that was all Rob. I mean, he just, he was like, I want to do Blade Runner. And I said, okay, you know, what, it, really a lot of it too was somebody challenging us and saying, what can be said about Blade Runner that hasn't been said before? Well, how'd you get William Sanderson? Yeah, Rob just dropped it, his manager an email, his manager who is his wife, and next thing we know, we were talking to him. That's so, amazing. Yeah, it was really cool. Actually, my favorite episode you guys did recently was Kiss Meets the Phantom. That, oh, good. I'm glad you liked that. That was I'm glad awesome. You liked that. I have fond memories of that <laughs> when that aired on TV. I was never a huge Kiss fan. Mm -hmm. I was more in love with the idea of Kiss yeah. than I was a Kiss fan. And when that was on TV, I, that looked like the creepiest, scariest, coolest thing ever. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I just remember like it again, like somehow convincing my parents to let me watch it because right. they were not big on no, you can't watch these you know weird, creepy yeah. things at night. It's like it's Kiss, right? You know. But I, you know, and I loved it. I loved it Good. when I saw it first time. But how would that come together? Really, that was uh, that went all the way back to the beginning of the podcast because that was what really. Um, made me decide to do a podcast is I listened to another podcast on Kiss Meets the Fan in the Park and they just kind of launched into talking about it and ripping on it and I was like you guys didn't even talk about the plot at all you know can we at least talk about that and you know kind of give more of a description of the film and right. that kind of stuff so really again it was kind of you know most of my stuff I just do out of spite so but yeah I just said okay 100th episode let's do Kiss Meets the Fan in the Park Rob knows a guy, John Stockwell, who was in a KISS tribute band, so he was our historian and uh, just kind of looked to see who we could talk to. You know, the producer is still around, Terry Morse Jr., and uh, met this guy, uh, Ron Albanese, who uh, was writing a book about Kiss Me, Fan in the Park, which unfortunately hasn't finished yet, but got him in there for a different perspective and just trying to get, you know, you could rip on that movie easily enough, but tried to get different perspectives of why is this possibly a good movie. It was a very not. engaging episode. Good, I'm so I, glad I was, you I was very it. entertained by that. Also, I, I should thank you for something, too. Sort of. Thank you. Sort of? Thank <laughs> you. You did an episode on one of those uh, pseudo Django sequels. Oh, yeah. And one I'd never heard of before. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, and when I was watching, I was, I was listening. I said, oh, i got to check this out. So mm -hmm. immediately after I listened to your podcast, I was like, I watched that mm -hmm. film. So what'd you think? Um, I liked it uh -huh. better than I thought normally I would have, right. but but I totally agreed with you. I should I should clarify. J Django kill if you live shoot. Right, Django yeah. kill if you live shoot. Uh, Thomas Millian is a star in this. He's not really. It's one of those fake Django. You know, it's right. where they slap Django on the title just to sell the yeah, film. They don't even call him Django. Cat. But you're right. It mm -hmm. has a very Jodorowsky feel to yeah. it. You mentioned how that you compared it to like 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 sort of like El Topo. Right. And it does have that feel with the town that he goes to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just such a strange film that there's no sympathetic characters yeah. at all. Even the lead isn't really that sympathetic. Right, no. And, and not very bright, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> he's not, not a very smart... He's not Clint Eastwood yeah. coming in and figuring stuff out. And... Let me ask you, of all the shows you've done, mm -hmm. which was the one that you're most proud of? 
I really enjoyed the RoboCop episode just because I got to talk to so many different people about that one. Uh, talking to Miguel Ferrar was amazing. He was a hoot to talk to. And, you know, we talked to Ronnie Cox and Nancy Allen and the screenwriters uh, and wow. Newmeyer. That's impressive. I don't like to say that we work in a vacuum, but we pretty much have our, you know, we're always focusing on what the next episode is going to be. And we're always looking, you know, we've got a roadmap going on of, you know, God, to like 2015, we've got shows kind of planned out. And we're talking like, okay, who can we talk to about this? And then occasionally, you know, something will fall in our lap and we'll say, oh, hey, an opportunity came up to speak to this person. What movie can we do about, you know, about that? Or, right. you know, sometimes we'll just reach out to see if we can get somebody. I mean, we, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Detroit 9000. And I said, okay, let's see if we can get Arthur Marks, the director of that. Sure enough, he wrote back to us within a couple of days. It's like, okay, there we go. Now we got that. I have not seen that film. That is a great That's one. That's one of those films I've been wanting, I've dying to see, and I have not seen I it. I believe it or not, I watched it just before I saw you, because ah. I just saw it was on Netflix streaming in HD, and I said, you know what? I haven't seen this in the theater. I saw it in the theater. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many years ago when Tarantino released it. Right. It's not perfect, but it's a great slice of 70s Detroit. Yeah, It's oh, a yeah. really great location film. And fact, I think Rocco. we were eating. I think we had, when we got together, we were eating near some of those locations. Yeah. Where I, what I'm really most impressed about about your show quite a, is that you really go out of your way to find people who would can be considered like, I don't want to say like not important character, you know, people, most people, it, they're people that get overlooked, mm -hmm. like for featurettes and interviews and things like that. And I'm glad that you seek these people out because they have a voice. And what I also like is that it's very rare to come off as um, knowledgeable without becoming a know-it-all. And your right. show is uh, very much like that. And I, I mean, Good. it's, it's, it's very, it's, I feel that you're enthusiastic Mm -hmm. They're shows. very well researched and they're complete, you know, Good. and it, without ever being long-winded or mm -hmm. anything like that. And again, I, it's, we're, yeah, we're sucking up we're to him because he's in a room. <laughs> That's part of it, but right. but it's a really enjoyable podcast. Yeah, give me that and if, if most of you haven't heard of it already, a lot of you have because it's been it's been brought up or links to your podcast have been put okay. on our Facebook page. Oh yeah, see, I have it. There you go. Thank you. Thank um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeding him. Yeah, this is me feeding him. Exactly. So yeah, I think our episode on Detroit Nine Thousand is one of those that just doesn't have as much traffic, and I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and I really I enjoyed that one a lot. I mean, we went down and we actually recorded on Belle Isle, which where some of the movie is shot. We recorded in Michael Simon's Roast uh, downtown Detroit, which is uh, the former hotel where some of the movie was shot as well. And the interview, the interview with Arthur Marks is great, but the interview with Alex Rocco, I think it's hilarious. He, that is one of my favorite interviews because he was just so honest about stuff and just talking, you know, talking trash about everybody. So it was great. And just talking about the great time he had in Detroit and talking about the cops that helped him out and some of the camera equipment that was stolen when the movie was happening. <laughs> Terrific interview. He was great to talk to. And I think the other one that doesn't have as much traffic as I would really like to see, and I don't know if this is the director overshadowing the film or not, but is our episode on Love and Death, Woody Allen's Love and Death. Hmm. And it was great. We had Keith Gordon, the actor-director, on there, and he was great to talk to. He was actually in some Woody Allen movies when he was like, a kid, like literally five Why years Keith, old. Why Keith Gordon? The, what, how did he come up? Well, as, as we had talked to him. Head. We talked to him uh, about Static. Mm -hmm. and had a great interview with him about Static. And I said, hey, Keith, if you ever want to come on the show, you know, here's a list of some of the movies that we're doing. Pick one and cool. you know, come on the show. And he said, yeah, I'd love to do Quiet Earth. I'd love to do, oh, God, I can't remember what all he said, but he said Love and Death. And he came on there, and he was just our third wheel on that one, and it was great. You know, he, and then, yeah, that he said that his father was in Take the Money and Run, and he was at the premiere of Love and Death. It's like... I had no idea that he was connected to this, but there he was. So and interesting. So he had great things to say, and it was just a lot of fun talking about that film. And But yeah, it's weird because, like I said, I don't know if it's that people don't like Woody Allen that much or what it mm. is, because I've actually had people say, I don't want to listen to this podcast because I hate Woody Allen. It's a whole generation of people yeah. seem to not like Woody Allen. And I, can, I, I understand, because a whole generation of people don't, I know, honey. I'm one of them. I hate him. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> His Stop earlier stuff is phenomenal. Right. His later stuff isn't anywhere as good, and the flaws that come with Woody Allen mm -hmm. become more exemplified, I think, with his later films. Right. 
Um, and that's that's a problem. That that can be a problem. That could be a blight on the rest of your uh, canon. Yeah. But I'm one of those guys yeah. who who I love Annie Hall. Mm -hmm. I love Bananas. I think yeah. that's hands down one of the funniest movies ever. Made. Right. Um, love and Death is great too. Yeah, Love and Death. We really kind of positioned it as this terrific transition between Sleeper and Annie Hall, where it's just you know he's got the filmmaking chops by that point, and it doesn't seem like a lot of people talk about that one, but it's it's hilarious. It's got the you know all the different angles, the Marx Brothers plus right. Dostoevsky, and just you know this weird mix of stuff going on. And it, to me, it's pitch perfect. I still quote that film. Tell us about Cahir du Cinemart. I started Cashiers way back in 94, and it was kind of out of that whole thing that we talked about earlier with the film thread and who do you think you're fooling? Because, I mean, 94, I'm just getting out of college, still really used to writing a lot of film papers. You know, uh, U of M is really more of a film theory school than a filmmaking school a lot of times, so did a lot of writing about films. And I really didn't feel like the whole story of the video was getting out there. So I kind of used that as a, uh, a tent pole and wrote about that and then started writing other things. Uh, would write reviews and that kind of stuff. And first few episodes were, you know, photocopied, just did the whole, like, what can I get away with for free at work? You know, I had a Xerox machine. I was working two jobs. I was working at uh, Comcast Cable at night and working at Blockbuster during the day. So I had access to a Xerox machine at night, and I had access to the um, the uh, postage meter during the day. Okay. So between the two, it was pretty low cost endeavor, and then just kept going from there. And uh, I think we're up to. Uh, was this something you had to hide from your bosses, or did they give you encouragement, or? Uh, they, you know, I was the only guy working at night at Comcast, right. so I had so the run of the place. Yeah, it was either masturbate on my boss's desk. Or start a zine. I wasn't okay, sure which one to that's do. A, so. That's a tough choice. Dude. Yeah. Often yeah. we have masturbated on our boss's death. Not uncommon. Yeah. Anyway. And and so it's and did, how many years ago did you start this? Ninety four. So gosh, coming up on twenty years. You know, okay. nineteen years this year. And you had you just did you have an issue just come out recently? Yeah. Last year we did issue seventeen, which was kind of I mean it really changed throughout the years and went from photocopied to kind of more of a comic book format to kind of more of a real magazine format and then the last two have been um well i did a run of uh xerox kind of stuff i went old school with that but then i also did a print on demand version of it okay. and then the last uh issue was just print on demand or um you could uh, get it on Kindle or Nook or something like of those an ebook, e yeah, magazine. Kind exactly. Of thing. And it's like it's basically it's a bunch of essays contributed by yeah. different people. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It was it was great. I mean, we had interviews, we had essays, and just kind of uh, we had some reviews in there. So just a really, I tried to get a wide mix of stuff. So uh, there were a lot of there was a great great article about Chuck Vincent movies. Okay. Uh, there was a terrific piece about um, Filipino exploitation movies by Andrew Leobold, the guy who's doing the Search for Wang Wang documentary. Okay. So, yeah, and, I mean, it was great. Just people who are, you know, experts on things or, or people that want to talk about the movies or the actors or the directors that they love and just kind of share that passion with people. Anything we should look forward to coming up, either with the podcast or the yeah. zine? Or... I have a new book coming out uh, probably before April of 2013 called Cinema Detours. And it's a collection of uh, reviews that I did for the Detroit Metro Times, this uh, website called Detour Mag, which unfortunately isn't with us anymore. So I took mm -hmm. all of those reviews, I think from like six different sources, just put them all together, and it's about... I'd say about 250 pages worth of reviews and just, wow. again, stuff that people may not have heard of. Who's so. publishing it or are you self-publishing it? Just going to self-publish it this cool. time. Yep. So it's awesome. We look forward to that. Cool. I hope you enjoy it. I hope there's I will de at definitely least, will. I hope there's at least one movie in there that you haven't heard of that you enjoy when you track it cool. down. Thank you very much, Mike White, for being with us. Uh, Thank you, guys. This is our new experiment, Brunch with the Cinephiles. Hopefully we get more special guests in <laughs> and we'll serve Pony. their brunch. I, I'm fine with and, just um, here. And if we'll have time, maybe we, you know, we really do it up. We'll do a little cooking thing as well. Ooh, nice. You can do it. Why not? Yeah. Right? yeah then we'll Turn right Anthony around. Brian, something like that, he'll be catching on fire. And right. we'll tell anyway, <laughs> but that's not all we're going to do with Mike White. We're going to do something. We're going to have another discussion with him later on, so stay tuned for that. 
please check out oh, what's this? Please check out uh, Mike's uh, podcast. Tell it where, where everybody can see it. Projection-booth.com. I'm Edwin Samuelson. This concludes this episode, or this very special episode of the Cinephiles. Thank you for tuning in, and please subscribe to the show and uh, check out Mike's uh, podcast. Thank you. <laughs>